Hello, I'm Debbie Bell Hosking for Finextra TV in the virtual studio, bringing you the Cybos 2024 series. And I'm joined by Sergei Nazarov, co-founder of Chainlink. We're going to be chatting about all things blockchain, AI and digital assets. Sergey, a big welcome to our virtual studio. Great to be here. Sergey, can we start off, if I can ask you please, what you think has triggered this increasing adoption of blockchain technology by asset managers? And also, what technology is needed? Sure, so I, I think the asset management industry, the buy side, has often driven capital markets towards new technologies and new ways of doing things because they're, in a certain sense, the foundational end user and customer of what the financial system does. I think the asset managers have kind of adopted blockchain technology in a faster way than many have expected in the capital markets, specifically BlackRock's Biddle, some of the funds from Fidelity, some of the great work by Franklin Templeton and, and others, right? So you, you've kind of started to see the buy side drive adoption of blockchain technology, which has made everyone else who serves the buy side in some form pretty interested in, in that problem. That has been one of, the, one of the big factors. Another big factor is the efficiency gains that are generated by applying blockchain technology to problems of settlement, collateral management, uh, payments, and various other more back office problems that are extremely valuable, but not particularly well understood even by some of their users because it kind of just works. But when you actually look at how it works, you, you see a lot of room for improvement. So there's these two big categories of adoption. And in the second category, you're seeing more and more stable coins, some central bank digital currency work, payments work, collateral management type work, settlement related work. And then in the first category, you're seeing more and more real world assets and tokenized funds from large asset managers and new issuances by banks of tokenized digital assets of various types. That is uh, in the next year, going to merge into a very productive active market because now you'll have a asset and you'll have an efficient payment method. And as those two things continue to meet more and more, you'll see more and more adoption because the efficiency and the ease of use of the payment method and the ubiquity of more and more available ways to buy and interact with digital assets and the growth and the amount and quality of digital assets as inventory and financial products that will naturally create a growing market. That's what we're what we're starting to see, and which uh, the asset management industry has kind of really in earnest kind of shot the gun in the air and started the race because of because of the adoption they're seeing. Uh, interestingly enough, they're seeing that adoption in large part from the public blockchain community. So I think you you will see the institutional TradFi community view of DeFi and the public blockchain community as a big, valuable customer base. And then I, I think what you're also going to see in the coming year is more and more of the TradFi community's users wanting access to DeFi yields and DeFi systems. And the TradFi folks will be in a position where they have to think of ways to provide that access. And what technology is needed to jump on board to be part of this? Well, it's, it's very complicated in capital markets because it's highly regulated and it has many legal requirements around compliance, privacy, identity, a huge amount of basically requirements. And the variety of transactions and asset types is also very large. So it's not the same situation that you have in the DeFi world where everything is kind of bubbling up from nothing, from scratch, and people are redefining the future in very simple ways, not worrying on, about existing conventions. In the, in the capital markets, you need interoperability, you need identity, you need privacy preserving uh, transactions at a minimum to do most of the institutional work. This is actually what we work on in the Chainlink community is how to provide that privacy, identity, data, interoperability across chains. So we're very familiar with these problems. One of the final things that I think you'll need is a certain compatibility of existing systems with blockchain systems. And personally, I feel that can be achieved by using existing standards like Swift messages to interface successfully with various blockchain systems in an efficient, secure, well-understood and reliable way. So initially, you'll have to solve 
identity problems, privacy problems, interoperability problems, which the Chainlink community is working very closely with many top banks, asset managers, FMIs, and others, and successfully solving many of those problems. And then you'll hit a certain level of scale for institutional adoption. But to hit true mainstream institutional adoption, you'll need uh, compatibility of their existing systems, risk management, accounting, and other systems with blockchains as essentially a transaction execution, asset uh, movement, payment, and, and other types of value transfer infrastructure, right? So that'll be the next challenge, which we, we are already actively working on and, and, and well on the way to, to solve it. I'm going to go back to that word uh, interoperability. How important is that for these capital markets to adopt blockchains and AI in digital assets? So th there's two levels of, of interoperability. One level is the ability for their counterparty to pay them for the asset to con con conduct a delivery versus payment transaction in the most basic form. And that asset might often be a stable coin or a central bank digital currency or a bank issued stable coin that they want to pay in that resides on their chain or some other chain somewhere. And the asset is in a different environment. So basically you have a huge fragmentation of liquidity and purchasing power across a multitude of different chains. This is the situation in the public blockchain world, but I think it's going to be even, even more exacerbated in the private blockchain institutional world once that really gets going. And so your, your first fundamental problem is how do I create the movement of liquidity towards my asset, towards my new issuance. And if you, you, you aren't connected to all the places from which people want to purchase your asset, you lose a part of the market. So it's going to be a very fundamental economic driving force of even if I issue my asset over here in this chain, I want to maximize the amount of purchasers that can access my asset across all chains. And how do I achieve that? That's where CCIP, the cross-chain interoperability protocol, from the Chainlink community comes in, which is already now being widely adopted by various banks, FMIs, asset managers, and others. That's what you know, CCIP seeks to solve. The second level of the interoperability problem is that interoperability between existing systems and blockchain systems, and actually across many different blockchain systems. And that's where you need an abstraction. You need what's in computer science known as an abstraction. And it, for, for that purpose, there is something called the blockchain abstraction layer which is how the kind of chain link system starts to define interaction with various chains through existing methods like Swift messages. And so that interoperability problem starts to get solved that way. Eventually you arrive at a world where the existing standards and messages can be reused to trigger a transaction for payment, for asset movement, for, for anything, for data related purposes. But that transaction is happening partly in traditional systems and partly maybe in its final state in the blockchain systems and actually happen, having to happen across multiple blockchain systems because the transaction involves the movement of an asset in return for a payment from two different or three different blockchains because you know the custodians will then end up having their own blockchains and they'll custody things there and you'll have just a multitude of different chains. The way to think about it is think about how many databases there are that hold all these value records and then let's assume that all that value migrates into a large amount of blockchains. So the value isn't stored anymore in databases. The value is now stored on blockchains, but it's stored on a multitude of blockchains, just like now it's stored on a multitude of databases. And so how do you connect all those data, all those new places where the value is stored, the blockchains with each other? And then how do you connect your systems to all of them to efficiently interface with them? Do you know, I'm thinking we almost need a separate interview just on interoperability because it's so in-depth. So thank you for that, Sergey. I'm going to jump now to another word that you've mentioned a lot, privacy, keeping things private. Why is it so important to keep on-chain transactions private? There's a multitude of compliance requirements and there's a multitude of economic reasons where counterparties don't want to reveal the trades they're doing or the amounts or the or who their counterparties are because they don't want that to affect the pricing or the relationship with, with other groups, other counterparties. So privacy is an ingrained fundamental property of the current financial system, both for legal requirements like compliance 
and for very strong economic reasons. So it's it's a fundamental feature of, of, of how the current system works. What we're working on is providing that same level of privacy across chains, such that you could use whatever new data format you want in a blockchain to store value. You can migrate the value that you usually transact in into that blockchain format. But you achieve certain levels of privacy for that value, and you achieve certain levels of privacy as it moves across blockchains. For this here at the at the conference, we released something called the Blockchain Privacy Manager that can sit in between a chain and another chain and allow the chain's owner to manage what information comes and goes out of the chain. And then we've also launched something called CCIP Private Transactions, which allows a transaction to between two chains to remain completely private, even from the bridging mechanism that's connecting the two chains. So in addition to other privacy capabilities that we have for identity like Deco, the Chainlink uh, platform and community are now, I think, heavily starting to expand into providing privacy, but providing it in a way that it can work on various chains and the cross chains for many, many different uses of privacy. Privacy also is applied differently to different situations. So you have transaction-related privacy when you move a transaction's value between two chains. You have privacy for data when you want to prove something about identity, but you want the identity data to remain private, but you need to prove something about the identity in order for the transaction to continue. And so it's it's really just uh, a large collection of tools, some of which solve the data privacy issues, some of which solve the transactional privacy issues, but you, you really need to use all of those tools to get to the threshold that the transaction as a whole is private. So I, I think the body of work here is not just a single tool, it's a multitude of tools to keep data private, transactions private, blockchain events on certain chains private, and then weaving that together into what eventually results into more private assets, more private transactions, but they are understandable and readable by the counterparties and by the relevant authorities that need to understand what's going on in order for that to be a legally binding compliant transaction. So this is this is kind of the world that the financial institutions need to exist in. And so this is the set of tools that, that me and the Chainlink community are, are working on. Sergey, as I said earlier, there's so much to talk about here. Um, and I know just listening to you and your passion for your subject that this is going to evolve even further beyond our conversations today. So thank you for sharing with us those tools and um, your insight into blockchain, AI, and those digital assets, privacy, interoperability. So thank you very much, Sergey. My pleasure. Thank you.